Good morning. If you would, take your Bibles and open them up with me to the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 1, Genesis, Exodus. Uh, this is part of the Old Testament. Old Testament meaning before the coming of Messiah, before Christ. Um, so the first part of the Old Testament is called the Pentateuch or the Torah or sometimes it's called the Law. It talks about five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We will continue all the way through these in our studies if the Lord tarries. Um, we have just finished Genesis. Now remember, the first 11 chapters of Genesis was talking about really God's relationship with the world. We went through creation. We went through the fall. We went through uh, the increasing wickedness of mankind to the point where God wipes out every living thing on the earth in a worldwide flood. Saves eight people, Noah and his family, his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Immediately after they get out of the ark, we see sin hasn't gone away. We see Noah sinning. We see uh, Ham, Noah's son, rebelling and mocking his father. And then we see from them, the pattern continues in Ham's family and his offspring in Canaan. And we watch that happen uh, to the place where we get to Genesis 11, where, hey, uh, the world is building monuments for themselves. They're not trying to make God's name great. They're rebelling against God. And so God changes the languages and scatters people and separates them. Where do nations come from? The main thing that separates nations is language. God did it at Babel. He reversed that, if you will, in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, where uh, everyone started hearing the language in their own. And so, what is the answer to confusion? The God, the church, God's way of reversing the curse. Anyway, we get to chapter 12. Chapter 12, all the way to the end of the chapter. First 11 chapters are about God and the world. Uh, from chapter 12 to 50 is all about God and his relationship with Abraham and Abraham's family. Uh, the nation, which will be the nation of Israel. Why is God so concerned with the nation of Israel? Because God's Son, the second person of the Trinity, is going to become incarnate. God is going to take on human flesh and be born. If he's going to be born and take on human flesh, he's going to have to be a part of some ethnic group. And... As we look back on history, we can say of a surety that he did. And he was part of the ethnic group of the Israelites. He was a Jew. Uh, which would tell us why uh, throughout history the Jews have come under so much persecution. And we're going to see the beginning of that right here in the book of Exodus. So... As we have gone through Genesis, think about it. We started with the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. And God created a world, and he created people in his own image to be a part of that eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. He starts with Adam, and he makes a covenant with Adam. As long as you don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're part of this with us. What do we find Adam doing? exactly what he was told not to do. We go from that and we get to Noah and the covenant God made with Noah that he would never again destroy the whole earth with a flood. He will destroy the whole earth one day, but it will be, the Bible teaches, with fire and not with water. We move from there in Genesis to the covenant that God made with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. The covenant where he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Your descendants are going to be like the stars and like the sand on the seashore. So there's going to be a heavenly aspect, a spiritual aspect 
to your descendants and an earthly one. The earthly one was the nation, the physical nation of Israel. The stars, the spiritual aspect would be anybody who names the name of Christ is in Abraham. He also tells him, look, everybody in the world is going to be blessed through you, Abram. Speaking about Jesus Christ. Remember, all of this happened when Abram was already an old man and had no children. Matter of fact, God even waits uh, more years until he's 100 years old before he has one child. One child of the promise, Isaac. Ishmael was his own working out in the flesh, and that has led to nothing but problems. So as you look at Exodus, uh, the, the word Exodus just means going out. So we already saw in the end of Genesis them going into Egypt as 75 people. Now this is going to be 400 years later, 400 plus years later, of their going out. So just get that picture going in and now Exodus going out. Genesis is a book of beginnings. This book is about them coming out of Egypt. That's clear enough. If you want more study on that, go to Psalm 72. You can read about that. You can go to Isaiah 11 and you can get um, a lot more understanding of the poetic nature that people wrote about this. Um, Exodus, the first 18 chapters of Exodus are all about them leaving Egypt. Then uh, 19 through chapter 40 are all going to be about the covenant that God makes with the nation of Israel at Sinai what we might call the giving of the law, what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. Who wrote this book of Exodus? Moses wrote this book. Um, Moses wrote the whole Pentateuch. Now, you, that might cause you to pause for a second when you start to say, uh, in this first chapter and the second chapter, it's going to talk about his birth. How did Moses write about his own birth? Well, obviously, uh, Moses wrote this later on. There, he was not alive when God created the world. It was just Adam and Eve. But the oral tradition, the oral history, uh, came all the way until Moses. And then Moses was the first one to start writing it down. You say, is the Pentateuch the oldest books in the Bible? And the answer to that is no. Um, the oldest book in the Bible, most scholars believe, is the book of Job. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the book of Job. We've got some more work in front of us before we get there. So, if you have not uh, read Exodus chapter 1, now is the time to do it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the revelation of yourself to us. If it were not for you revealing yourself to us, we could never know you. But in your loving kindness, in your grace, and in your mercy, you have given. You have initiated love to each one of us. Father, I pray that we will respond and return that love to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's interesting that in uh, the first word of this book is now. So now what? Well now, remember in Genesis, every new thought was the word now. So this is just a continuation um, with the skipping of about between verses 7 and verses 8 is 430 years plus uh, of uh, separation. So it says, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Uh, 
All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in person, but Joseph was already in Egypt. You say, why do they keep talking about the 12 sons of Israel? Well, it's, it's very important because the 12 sons of Israel are going to become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And each one of these tribes is going to have an allotment of land except for the sons that we talked about. Reuben would not get an allotment of land. Simeon would not get an allotment of land, and neither would Levi. We've already talked about that in Genesis. So it's very important that these tribes remain intact. And we're going to see some of them, but most importantly, the, the tribe that needs to stay intact is the line or the tribe of Judah. Why? Because Messiah is going to come through that tribe. Why is that important? Well, what we're going to have, and I think this is very interesting, they're going to keep birth records all along the nation of Israel's history. Birth records. Why did they keep such meticulous birth records right within the tabernacle and then the temple? Why? Because the land was directly tied to the tribe that you were a part of. So if you didn't know what tribe you were in, you weren't going to get an inheritance of land. So that's very important. Interesting enough, it also gives a record, what we see in Matthew 1 and in Luke, the beginning of Luke, of the genealogies and the record of the line of Christ. And people could look at Messiah and could look at the records in the temple and could know that Jesus Christ was qualified. He was qualified to be the king of kings because he was from the tribe and the family of David. He was from the tribe of Judah, which would fulfill prophecy. Interesting enough, uh, the majority of the nation of Israel to this day does not believe that Messiah has yet come. That's important in this regard. A few years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, let's say AD, 33 AD, uh, eight, in 70, Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem. And along with destroying Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple to the point where not one stone of the temple was on another. Um, and in that, all the genealogical records were destroyed. So therefore, now, if someone comes on the scene and says, I'm Messiah, there's no genealogical record to prove that this person goes all the way back to the line of Judah. So, uh, just another affirmation that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It says this, um, verse 6, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. Again, affirming, um, if you sin, you're going to die. Satan's a liar. But the sons of Israel were fruitful increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Um, I think uh, Moses is on purpose using language from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, let's go back there. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living things and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse in the, of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and every living thing that moves, which was uh, with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. God saw that it was good. There's this, it says God blessed them and saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Um, this, this same thing, uh, increased greatly, is the same phraseology that is used about swarms. <laughs> there were swarms of fish. There, now there's swarms of Israelites. 
Um, now, like we said, in between verse 7 and verse 8, there's 400 plus years of separation. It says, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It, it may not be that he did not, that he didn't know his name, because remember, Joseph was embalmed, his body was never buried, so his body was there. People talked about Joseph. Our country is just a little over 200 years old, so about half this time. We still talk about George Washington. Um, however, I think you, you've seen just lately, as the political tides turn, uh, history has a way of being... Uh, rewritten. And people that were revered in the past somehow become scapegoats of the future. Now remember what happened when Joseph uh, provided for Egypt and the world during the famine. All of the Egyptians lost their money, lost their livestock or their wealth and their land. All of it became Pharaoh. And at some point, years and years and years down the, the way, this became angst. And remember, during this time, because of Joseph, Jacob's family, the Israelites, were given the best of the land down there in Goshen. And what do we find? We find that they're increasing greatly, and the Egyptians are getting ill about it. What's, it says, he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. They come. Still, Israel is a minority in Egypt, but their growth rate is so much more than the Egyptians that it's starting to scare the Egyptians. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply and in the event of war the Hittites were just to their north and they were afraid that the Hittites could come and invade them and then Israel would help the Hittites because there was a connection from Canaan and that somehow they would be overthrown. They were paranoid. They will join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So the same old hatred that they have towards shepherds is still there toward Israel. And now they don't really care that much about what Israel's family in the past had done to help them. It doesn't seem so important 400 plus years later. So they make them slaves. They appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. They started to enslave them. How long was the slavery? Some people say an estimate of, of the 430 years, the 284 of them, they were slaves. Others say that it was only about 134 years um, of slavery. You see, where are they getting that from? There are some paintings, some ancient paintings on cave walls in Egypt, which is interesting because the climate in Egypt is very dry which lends to preserving things better. And there's paintings of taskmasters with whips using them on people with staves, uh, staff like shepherd staves. So the idea is that that is probably picturing uh, the nation of Israel there. But there's not agreement on uh, what the date of that was. So whether they were slaves for 284 years or whether they were slaves for 134 years, they've been slaves for a long time. It says, um, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. Now we know that the nation of Israel did not help them build the pyramids, because the pyramids at this point would have already been built. So these were storage cities, not, remember, the uh, pyramids were 
tombs for the pharaohs. It says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. So they think, hey, if we enslave them, they're going to be so tired that they're not going to want to have as many children. But that's not what happened. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Remember, we've said this in Genesis, but we'll uh, refer to it again. If the nation of Israel had stayed in Canaan, they probably would have intermarried and would not have been distinct people. But in moving them down to Egypt, the Egyptians were known for their racial superiority, what they thought was racial superiority, so they would not intermarry with the Israelites. So you can see God's hand all the way in that. Um, in Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, 17, I want to read this to you. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 and verse 17, it says this. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. This was many hundreds of years later in the future, but we see this being played out even in the inception of the nation of Israel. It doesn't matter what the Egyptians do. It's not uh, slowing down the growth of this nation. Why? Because God is doing it. And God's plan, remember, God's plan cannot be stopped. However, if I rebel against it or I submit to it, whatever I do will really determine how I experience God's will. Verse 15, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, uh, one of them whose name Shifra and the other name Pua. Pua. Now, obviously there was more than two wives for the nation of Israel. These are Hebrew names, so we know they're Hebrew women, Hebrew midwives. These are probably the ladies that oversee all of the midwives. All midwives are people that help uh, pregnant women deliver their babies. So Pharaoh gets with them and said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, you shall let him, then she shall live. The idea was that in one generation, if you kill all of the boys, then the nation will cease to exist. And you take all the girls and you marry them up with, they wouldn't marry them with regular Egyptians. So the people that are servants or slaves in Egypt, they would let them all marry. And then there would be no more Israel. Uh, this thought, this genocide has been tried to be used on Israel many, many times in history, and it, has, it failed every time. Why? No weapon formed against God is going to prosper. Can I fight against God? Clearly I can, but I will never win. That's the difference. So here, this is really, Genesis 3.15 says the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman are going to be at each other, but that the seed of the woman eventually is going to get bit by the seed of the serpent, but that heel is going to crush the head of the serpent. Here, Satan is all along trying to destroy this nation that God is bringing. Why? Because he knows that ultimately Messiah is going to come through this. doesn't know when. But ultimately, the Messiah is going to come and, and crush him. And he wants to delay that 
as long as possible, and he wants to take as many of us along his rebellious plan and kingdom as he can. So all along, until Jesus Christ is born, there is this threat of trying to wipe out the nation of Israel. And when Jesus is on the cross, you can understand why Satan feels like that he's won. He's tried to wipe this guy out, and finally he kills him. But according to God's plan, he's killing him and is actually fulfilling God's plan. And the death has no hold on him. Verse 17 is quite a testimony of these two women. It says, but the, the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. It reminds us of the apostles in Acts 4.19 or Acts 5.29 where Peter states, Hey, we've got to obey God, not man. Now, there's several places in scripture, including Romans 13, where it tells all of us that we should submit to the governing authorities over us. However, if the governed authorities over us is telling me to do something that is in rebellion and disobedient to God's clear-cut commands, then I am going to disobey the government. That doesn't mean I'm going to get my AK-47 and have a shootout at my house against the government. I should be aware that if I disobey the government to obey God, just like in Acts, I will probably go to prison. But God can also use that for his glory. These women feared God. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife can get to them. They're a lot faster at giving birth than the Egyptian women. Many, many commentators state here that Pua and Shifra were lying, that they were deceiving Pharaoh. I do not believe that one lick. Why? Because it says, so God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied. God was doing this. Give glory to God. If it doesn't say that the midwives were lying to Pharaoh, then they weren't lying to Pharaoh. So let's not stain their character on something that we do not know. Remember, God promised Abram back in chapter 12 of Genesis, say, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Here it's happening. Satan's trying to stop it, but he can't. He can't form any weapon that's, or no war that's going to stop God's plan from happening. Satan can't do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. Nobody can do it. The only choice you and I have, Satan's already made his choice. The only choice I can make is whether I'm going to continue like I was born to rebel against God or whether I'm going to surrender myself to him and become actively in submission to his will. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very great. Because the midwives feared God, he, God, established households for them. Now, I don't know exactly what this means. Many people believe that the midwives were people that did not have their own families or their own children, and that through this, that God gave them that. I think that's probably the best illustration. But whatever it is, maybe maybe it is they had children and God protected their own children through this, but whatever it is, God protected them and their families because of they really in faith put themselves out there. I mean, think about it. They're going against the the most powerful man in the world. Two women and God protected them. As we finish this chapter out, it says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile. I don't believe that it's every son of all of the Egyptians. It's like clearly it's stating in context, Every son 
that is born, that's Jewish, drown them. And every daughter you are to keep alive. So it gets ramped up from slavery to abortion, uh, even partial birth abortion, to actual uh, infanticide. Um, but again, it's not going to work. And as we close out today, I, I would ask you this. Do you find yourself fighting against God? Do you find yourself mad at God? Confess it as sin. Humble yourself before God. God is good. His plan is good. Sometimes it leads us through difficult circumstances. But all of it is for his glory. And it will contribute to our good. So my prayer today is that you would be about, and that I would be about, glorifying God and carrying out his will. But even on that more, that I would enjoy today. My prayer is that you will enjoy today also. Father, you are so, so good. Your will is so, so good. And Father, help me to be about your will. Even if it means the end of my own physical life. Because we know that stepping out of this life is just stepping into eternal life. And it is our hope. In Jesus' name we pray.